So um, it's great to be uh, with you. Um, imperfect, but, you know, um, that we're having to do it via Zoom, but um, uh, better than not doing it, I think. Um, and I'll be working to, you know, make up these extra um, extra lectures. Let's um, let's talk about the material, though. So uh, for today, um, we're going to move on from our discussion last time of the introduction. That is chapter one, chapter two, and chapter three. And now we're doing chapters four and five on context on the one hand and on the uh, relationships uh, on the other. And uh, I wanted to you know, discuss uh, some of this material and, and, and you know, make sure that despite this remote format, that others have a chance to chime in. Um, so these two chapters are getting, you know, a little bit more nitty gritty in terms of kind of um, some particulars. They build on kind of the spirit of what we saw in in chapters two and three and sort of illustration um, some general principles, but but getting quite a lot closer to category theory um, um, notation, um, some of the key sort of uh, more specific ideas like composition, um, uh, and some ideas on the ways in which we sort of use context uh, and can switch context, but need to be conscious of our context to know, for example, what an arrow means, right? So we we saw, you know, that uh, arrows, uh, which will turn out to be called arrows or morphisms in uh, category theory are, um, uh, are a key, key construct. Um, but we saw that they could encode different different things, right? So we had we had some arrows that encoded familial relationships, right? Um, so an arrow A is sister of B, and you know, um, so so B is the sister of A, I should say. C is the mother of B, and that means that C. Uh, is uh, an aunt um, uh, of uh, uh, is an aunt of A basically, um, uh, and, uh, and and this is and and excuse me excuse me I've got to be careful I have that backwards. So uh, A is a sister B B is a mother of C and therefore A is a is an aunt of C right. Um, so uh, here. Uh, B is the mother of C. A is the sister of, of B. A is an aunt of C. Um, and, you know, by stringing these together, um, you can get, you know, very different um, uh, types of familial relationships um, described there. And um, we'll come back to this point about something called composition involved. But we've also seen that arrows here can encode kind of things like rotations, rotations of a shape, or they could include things like factors of a number. Do you remember this? Sort of six is a factor of, of 42, two is a factor of six, right? Um, and three is a factor of six, but three is not a factor of 14, so there's no arrow. Here, arrows mean one thing is a factor of another. Um, and, you know, there's uh, there's other meanings which are explored here as well. Like here, um, uh, what is, can you tell me, what is an arrow from this set containing A to the set containing, for example, C, uh, A and C, or to the set containing A and B and to the set, uh, you know, so for those those two or from B to A and B and B to C, 
What do you think this arrow represents here? What does the arrow represent in this diagram? Anyone? Set membership? Yeah, set member or subset. This is a subset of that, right? Mm. Because A and C is, yeah, it's a subset of A, B, and C, right? Um, and anyone recognize this? What is What does that symbol represent? Null right. set. Yeah, the null set, the the empty set, set with nothing in it, and it is a subset of of all of all of these. Now you'll notice for um for this uh this this one here um we didn't draw an arrow from two to forty two. Do you know? Do you know why? It's actually mentioned in the book, but it can. Easily be missed. Why didn't why didn't we draw an arrow from two to forty two? Because it's there implicitly. Because they're connected yes. through other arrows. It's there implicitly. We'll come back to to a little bit more about what's going on here. But it's there implicitly. There exists a composition of this arrow and this arrow. There have to by the rules, uh, and that means that two is a subset of 42, but we don't have to draw it, which would both make our diagram messier and would would sort of thereby distract us. It, you know, it's just parsimonious to just say, well, it's implied. Um, there's also another type of arrow missing from this, but which always exists. And what is that arrow? Anyone want to say? For every one of these, I'll tell you, there's another arrow that's not shown, and it's a very particular arrow, very specific arrow, a special arrow. Anyone remember to it? it was, mm -hmm. To itself? To itself, exactly. So 14 is a divides itself evenly, right? Three divides itself evenly. It divides 21, yeah, but it divides six, but it also divides itself, right? It goes evenly into itself. But we don't draw that because it's implied. It's always there. And, and you know, that's worth noting. Now let's go, here's another type of diagram, um, which has to do with quadrilaterals, right? Um, types of quadrilaterals, squares and parallelograms and rhombuses and rectangles and, and so on. Here's another one, right? Um, have to do with, you know, pausing different relationships of, of sort of privilege or power or or um, social status or or what have you, um, which says you know uh, that there's uh, uh, you know rich males compared to rich other people are are tend to be higher status or rich white males compared to other rich males tend to be to be higher higher status. Um, anyway, that it encodes. Arrows here mean something different. Arrows here mean something different. Um, it, it's kind of like, uh, can you tell me what what do arrows here kind of represent? If, if there's an arrow from square to rhombus, as a general rule, you could see there are several types of arrows, um, but they indicate what? Uh, like subsets again, kind of like squares are a subset of rhombuses, for example. Uh, yeah, yeah, and and rhombuses generalize squares by relaxing angles. Uh, rectangles generalize squares by relaxing. Here, here, relaxing that angles be equal. Here, relaxing that sides be equal. Right. Um, um, become rectangles. Rectangles are like squares with a relaxed rule about their sides, right? Um, and parallelograms are like rectangles with relaxing the constraint on their angles, or they're like rhombuses relaxing the constraints about about sides, maybe it's opposite, uh, about sides being equal or what have you. Um, anyway, um, th the point is, you know, arrows mean different things here, right? Um, in all these diagrams, but they're useful and, and Eugenia Cheng, you know, comments that well, we could kind of communicate some of that same information by putting things above each other on the page sometimes, like like putting these things at different lengths up the page. You know, arrows form this extremely versatile general way of describing it, and and we'll often 
write on the arrow, indicate on the arrow what relationship is implied. Is it one of factorization? Is it one of meaning one thing divides another? Is it one of meaning one thing is less than or equal to another? Uh, is it one associated with you know subsets um, of another? Um, um, one thing generalizes another or what have you. Um, uh, one thing is a rotation of another by a certain amount. Um, it, it's kind of cool. But all of these share these kind of properties um that you know you have these um ability to compose things um what is composition like in this one that i'm showing mean what, what does that mean mm -hmm. so in, in this where we use these diagrams to kind of show you know these are rotations what does composition of two of these arrows mean Uh, rotate and then rotate again. Yeah, rotate and rotate again. Yeah. So, and you'll notice that here, this is what does this what does this mean? What does this sort of parallel vertical lines mean? Anyone? It's a rotated what? It's a rotated one of mathematicians' favorite things. A rotated what? begins with E. There's two words. First begins with E, the next begins with S. It's a equal sign. It's an equal sign put on its side. That's saying that these two compose to be this. Why, why would it be? Why would 90 degree rotated by 90 degrees and by 270 compose to be zero? Anyone? They sum to 360, so it's a full rotation. Yeah. yeah, it's a full rotation. So they're equal, right? Um, these things compose uh, as well, um, right? So um, if if uh, B is the mother of C and A is the sister of B, they compose to B as an ant, ant of C, an ant of C. Um, these compose to be a great ant what composition means and what the rules are and what kind of things when you compose them equal another one will depend on the setting, the context, um, the meaning of these relationships, but they're, they're equal. Um, here things compose, I would argue. What, and in what sense does the, do these things compose? I said it earlier. But remember, what is what does the arrow mean here? Two does what to six? Two. What is this asserting? What is it? What sort of relationship is this stating? That two what six divides evenly. Yeah, divides evenly, right? And six divides evenly forty two. What would the composition mean here? If you think about it, divides evenly is kind of. It's like a Boolean, right? It's it's kind of like the economist. It's either it does or it doesn't divide it evenly, right? Three does not evenly divide 14, but it does evenly divide six, right? So what does the composition mean? If, if we have one from two to six, so one from six to 42, what, is, what does that composition mean here? That they kind of compose, they, they can be put end on end and, and be another arrow that, that that's, it turns out that's always going to hold. What 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 does the composition of these mean? What what relation would it be saying if we compose this to this and this to this? What do you think? What what fact is it capturing that relation that results from composing these? Multiple of these each other a subset of multiple of each other and connect and connect to each other. Okay, okay, yes, yeah, so you're getting, uh, yeah. related to each other. Okay, that's true, but we can sharpen that a bit. Anyone? Because that's true, Nona. Absolutely. I'm going to sharpen a bit. Larissa, were you going to say something? I'm not sure if this is what you're looking for, but like two is a factor of six. Exactly. It means if two is a factor of six and six is a factor of 42, the composition means that what? Two is a factor of 42. Of 42. 
Yeah, exactly. Two is a factor of 42 as a result. That's the result of composing these. There is an arrow from two to 42. Um, turns out they'll have to be um, for, for it to be a category. This thing composed with this means there is an arrow from this to this. Um, that, that's captured, that's implicit in the structure. Um, there will be an arrow, that's the composition. It's gonna go from the source of the first arrow to the target of the second arrow. So whenever you have two arrows end on end, two to six, for example, here in six to 42, those are end on end. So there has to be an arrow from the source of the first, that's two to six, so it's two. The source of that one to the target of the second one. Second arrow is from six to 42, so 42. So there's gotta be an arrow from two to 42. And it makes sense, right? Two divides 42, if two divides six, and six divides 42, two has to divide 42. Mm -hmm. That's a composition, okay, in this, in this meaning. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, no, no, were you going to say something? In the algebra, uh, we, uh, we, uh -huh. uh, linear algebra, we, we say transitivity. For example, A related yeah. to B, B related yep. to C, uh, yep. equal yep. A related yep. to C. Yep. Great. That's exactly right. That's re and that's yet another face of this. The Roman god Janus had two faces, the two faces of Janus. And and like category theory is like infinitely many faces. So it's like uncountably large number of faces. And that's another face of this. It's because there's a category there, Nona, it turns out. Here, wh what does composition mean? So we'll take two arrows end on end. And I tell you, two arrows end on end. There's always a composite. There's always one that's from the com composition, composing those two arrows. So if we go from B to, from the set of just B to the set of, of A and B, and we go, and, and that indicates subset of B is a subset of A and B. Now this set is a subset of that. And if there's another one from A and B to A, B, and C, indicates a subset, A and B is a subset of A, B, C. What does it mean? What would their composite mean? That what? B has what relation to A, B, and C? That it's a what? Subset. 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 Yeah. And this is another example of a structure where the arrow is either absent or present, right? You don't, like in this structure, you don't have multiple arrows from B to C. You can't, you can't have that, it turns out. Um, you know, for, for this one up here, um, these sort of ones um, up at the top, in principle, you could have like several types of relations, right? Like, like, like say from saying that B is the mother of C, maybe B is also the teacher of C. Maybe B is the closest confidant to B of C. Maybe C is also the, you know, um, um, the the closest lookalike, um, or has the same eye color as C, or whatever. You could have multiple types of arrows, um, you know, for, but and you could have multiple arrows between B and C, right? For this type of meaning of an arrow, whereas this type of meaning of an arrow, you don't have multiple arrows from one thing to another. It'll be, it's either absent or present, okay? Um, uh, and that's a special type of category, it turns out, um, or special type of, uh, it's a class of categories, pre-orders that, that are very common, extremely common. This is another example of it. You either have the arrow, you don't. Zero or one arrows. Zero or one. You either, you either have an arrow from B to this or you don't. So what what does the composite say? If if we have a, two arrows end to end, B to A and B, and another arrow from uh, A and B to A B C, what's the composite mean? It means that Nestoran, no. No, when uh, the uh, relationship is this, it remains the same. Uh, uh, we we didn't we don't need uh, 
uh, I mean, um, direct. Uh, yeah, that's right. Direct relationship. Yeah. But, and, and we can infer yeah, that there is an arrow from B to ABC, which means if there's an arrow from B to ABC, what does that mean? From the set B to the set ABC, what does that mean if there's a direct arrow? Or if there's an arrow? If there's an arrow there, which is implied by this diagram, what does it mean? That B what compared to ABC? B is this subset of... Sub uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So here, you don't even have to... You know, there's, that's what arrows mean in this diagram, right? It's a, it's a subset. Up here, you know, arrows mean different things, and we clarify it by by writing this. Um, there's different types of arrows, and, and that, that, that's another very... Here, arrows are different sorts. Here, it's, it's kind of one, one, one meaning here. So we, we ignore, you know, what, what sort it is, but it does imply, like, according, you know, by the, by the thoughts governing this diagram, you know, rich white males are, are kind of more, more privileged or higher status in society uh, in the U.S. than, than, um, you know, any uh, just just anyone who's who's white or something like that, and other people who are white. Um, I think I think she said it like that. So, so we have we have these different types of arrows that that are discussed in the in the relationships chapter, right? This is this is in the chapter on on relationships, right? Um, and we see how arrows or these what are going to be called morphisms. Maybe that's a more scary term for it, but it's a very useful term. Um, correspond to these. Um, they they encode them, and and I want to highlight that there's Eugenia Chang is brilliantly sort of weaving in some multiple elements of learning because you know she starts out with these very concrete diagrams here. You know, with two and fourteen and forty two and you know, very. Very, very, very specific things here for a lot of them. Um, and she talks about, you know, how, you know, in this category, things mod four, you know, if you add three to one, you're like adding by three is like an action taken on four. You know, another category might involve rotation by 90 degrees here. It's adding three and you get zero. Why, why do you get zero here? I want to be Make sure everyone's on board with this. Why do you get zero? Because it will equal four and the remainder of four is zero. Yeah, exactly. This is this is in a mod four context. So in mod four, it goes zero, one, two, three, and then what's the next? Zero. Zero again? Zero. Zero. Yeah. So you take one, you add three. You wouldn't. Base ten, you get four, but but here, four is zero, right? Um, uh, and mod four category, yeah, mod four, and you add three to two, and you get what? Well, add one to it. Okay, two to three, three to four, and then four to what? Um, I'm oh, sorry, oh, sorry, screwed that up. <laughs> two to three, three. What's one? What's what's uh, plus one? If you apply the plus one operator to three, what do you get? Four, but mod zero is going to be Z zero. Zero. I mean, mod add, four. Add, yeah. And then you add one more, right? Add one more. We're adding three. So two to three, three to zero, and zero to one, right? That's why we get the one, right? And 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 there's kind of a rule here that, you know, you got a three and so you, those compose to be the same as adding one, um, right? You go, yeah. You can you can add this and get this intermediate product and add two more and you'll get two, or you can just add one. These two are the same, right? Um, if you're in a mod four category, you can do that and that, or you can just do do this thing, which is. You're not going into the intermediate thing, right? And and what her point is, though, with this, she starts with these very specific things, which I think we're going to come back and we're going to see there's a category of elements, which is actually quite 
related to what she's doing here, but that's a rather advanced concept. We might or might not get to in this course, but but as she says, like these could be anything. What what do I mean that these could be anything that that we're showing these kind of circles? What what do we mean by by just showing circles instead of writing one and zero and two? What is what does this kind of mean that that she's showing these as kind of circles? Anyone? Uh, they don't necessarily have, have to, have to be, be numbers. numbers. Like, uh, for example, they could be maybe matrices that we're doing operations on well, or even like functions in a programming language or something. OK, we, we will be getting there with 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 categories. But in this case, it could be any number. Right? It doesn't matter that it's one, like regardless of if this is zero or one or two, if you add three to it in, in mod four, right, if you. If this is zero and you add three to it, you get three, right? Um, and you add two to that, you get one, right? And that's the same as going from zero to one. Or this could have been one at the start. You add three, you get zero. You add two, you get two. And that's the same as adding one to the original thing, which was one, right? Um, if you start with two and you add three mod four, what do you get? If you start with two and you add three mod four, what do you get? One. Yeah, one. One. Um, and then you add three. Mm -hmm. Um, or oh, sorry, you add two. Excuse me. One plus two mod four is what? So one plus two mod four is what? Three, right? Mm -hmm. One plus two, three mod four. It doesn't yet wrap around, right? And that's the same as taking that two and adding one, three. So no matter what this number is, this this equality holds. Do you see that? No matter what number we start with, mod four, if we do this and we do that, we get this. Does that make sense? And so we abstract over that. We just we just have this um, this you know abstraction, and basically says whatever this is. It's not saying these are all the same equal number. Don't don't think it's identical numbers. That, that that this one is the same as that one is the same as that. no no no. It's like no matter what number this is, you know, it will be the case that that the the composition of these two things, doing one after the other, will be the same as this. Does that make sense? And 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 you know, if you think about it, this is what's going on here, right? No matter who this is, A, B, and C are. You know, it could be, um, it could be here. And where's my, ah, where's my, gosh, did I, did I d delete it? Um, yeah, here. Um, you know, if uh, this could be my sister, this could be my mother, this could be her sister, or this could be, you know, you, your mother you know, her sister, whatever, whoever these are, you know, you're going to have this equivalence, right? Um, so um, this is a rule, and the, the same thing here, no matter what, you know, if you rotate it by 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 90 here, and you rotate it by 270, you're going to gonna get this. I guess this one is, is, is kind of less compelling. And, and she shows these things down here to kind of make a similar point, right? You get these different shapes, and I'll come back to that in a minute, right? We'll get so you get these different shapes based on, you know, the nature of the factors, right? Um, and and the the thing is, these are some of the patterns that we get, right? Here's here's a pattern we get, and we get it for certain types of numbers, where you have three different numbers, a, b, and c. A, you know, three different primes, A, B, and C, and you multiply them together, and you get this structure. The primes could be two, three, and five, right? In which case, this is multiples of thirty, and I think that's one of the one of the examples here. Yeah, right. Um, um, or they could be, or you know, here you could get um. 42, right? Um, where 42 is 
two times three times seven. Those are three different primes, but you get that same structure of factorizations. And her point is you, you get that same structure with these things as well, with subsets, right? I mean, the, the, the same structure comes out. The same pattern is generated here, you know, in terms of the connectivity by these these different contexts, right? Um, it, it it generates the same pattern. The mechanisms involved kind of generate uh, the same pattern. And category theory is all about, you know, seeing, going from one area and seeing the same pattern and capturing the essence of it, the essence of it. Um, so we we have, you know, these uh, these sort of patterns that come out when you have numbers of, of different sorts. This is for like a cube, some prime cube times another prime, you know, a different prime. And notice she's, she's, you know, using these variables to indicate, hey, this is general. You know, it doesn't, this would be the case for two cubed times three, right? Eight times three, right? Two cubed is eight times three, right? 24. But it's also the case for, you know, three cubed times five, right? 27 times five, right? Uh, 100, yeah, um, 27 times five, right? Uh, and, um, and so, you know, uh, 135, right? Um, it's, it's different. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's the same basic pattern, no matter, no matter if it's that, or it might be, you know, uh, five cube times, you know, uh, uh, 37 or whatever. Same, same basic pattern emergence, right? Um, uh, so we see this, this these sort of relationships uh, captured in this way. Um, and you notice that these arrows, these morphisms are playing this kind of key role, but we have this underlying common thing we can compose them we can if we have two end on end we know we know and we don't even have to show it um it's implied that there is a if there's one from a to b and there's another one from b to c there's got to be one from a to c and by drawing it out we can specify what it is um but in a diagram like that, we don't have to do this. We don't have to draw this out because it's it's implied. There there it, it, there is no choice. It it's three divides this right. We don't have to label it. But when we when 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 it's not clear what it is, we write it out like this. We we say, oh, it's this is a great ant relationship, right? If if we didn't label this, we wouldn't know well, what sort of relationship is it. Here we we label it for that, um, and we see that sometimes. When we compose things, we get the same thing as another relationship, right? That this has to itself. And we'll come back to that. Um, uh, so, you know, we we get these reuse of relationships, right? Um, in other words, sometimes these two composed are the same as an existing one. That that, that they must be the same as some existing one. That that. Um, is is there it's 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 a given what what it is uh, for for our context i thought that was kind of fun now i do want to highlight in all these diagrams there's always a self length we said earlier we don't draw things if they're they're self lengths so what what's the self length for this one here where my mouse is over what's the self length what's the relationship from this square to itself that just kind of yields itself back. Um, remember, she has that little thing that says this way, and sh she's not drawing that here. But what's the thing that if it said this way on it, it would leave it unchanged? What What is that thing? It's the what rotation? It's the zero or, or any, any multiple of 360. Yeah. yeah, that's good. But yeah, it's it turns out, yeah. Uh, it it is equivalent to three sixty. That's right. Um, but yeah, uh, actually, yeah, that's right. Because yeah. this is a square, 
This is a score every uh, nine, uh, 90 degrees. That's true. Yeah. The, 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 yeah, and Eric it's says, but the, the one that's, that's absolutely guaranteed, the others come about by a, a kind of a feature of this category that, hey, if you rotate, you know, by 360, it's the same, but one that's guaranteed is like zero. Zero, you're not ready to get it all. You know, the others, it turns out, come about because of properties of this. Um, what what is the what is the kind of self arrow that we don't draw, but it's implied here? What is it for this one? I, I tell you there's the self one from two to itself and six to itself. And Larissa said earlier what it is. What is it? It says if there's if I tell you there's a special arrow for all of these things, it's a special arrow from it to itself. For each of these, from 14 to itself, from 21 to itself, to six to itself. What's what's the nature of that arrow? What is it asserting? That what? What do all the arrows here assert? That what? That it's a factor of itself. It's a factor of itself. Six divides itself. 14 divides itself. 21 divides itself. 42 divides itself. Two divides itself, right? One divides itself. So we don't even write. We don't even write. Yeah. Um, um, what's the self-arrow from here to here? What What's the sort of special kind of identity arrow, we might call it, here? What What is it? It's adding what? What What is guaranteed to give itself? No matter what mod system we're in, what's guaranteed to, to give itself? Adding what? Zero. Zero. Adding zero. Um, that's right. And there's one to itself here, which is like, do nothing. Like, don't relax anything. Like, right? Uh, this one, yeah, this one to itself. It says, you know, um, they're, they're uh, at least as privileged as themselves or whatever. Um, what is the self arrow from here to the self? She actually mentions this. What's, what's the self arrow? What could we label it? She actually says in the text in passing, what 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 is the self arrow here? I'm almost giving just, it away. Just uh -huh. self. Self. Like themselves. They are the self of themselves or something, right? They are their own self. Um, fair enough. So all of these have these arrows, and it turns out the self arrows will have some will have some rules, kind of a associated with them, um, how they compose with things. But we'll be getting to that, um, decomposing. You know, any any of them composed with another arrow will just be that other arrow, right? If we add zero and then we add three, it'll just be add three. If we add zero, you know, if we have a, you know, if we have zero into itself and we add two, it'd be just two. So it always like composes with another arrow to just be that other arrow mm. so that that self, that identity relation, which sometimes is an action, sometimes it's a relation, you know, sometimes it's saying this is less than, sometimes it's saying this divides, sometimes it says this rotated by something gives this, sometimes it's saying this person, you know, you know, the mother of this one. There's always a self one, which when you combine it with that, it, it's just that other, other thing. Um, so if B is the mother of, of C, right? Um, and B is their own self, um, then you compose those two, it's just B is the mother of C. Nothing terribly new there, right? Um, if if uh, A is the sister of B, well, you compose it with B's being their own self, and, just A is this is through B. Yeah, okay. Um, it's a lot of fun, but I, I just want to highlight, like these all have this same properties. And we're going to see that that's key for the definition of a category. I mean, we've almost get, almost given a lot of the, the essence of a category there, these, these sort of patterns we keep on seeing again and again. But the key thing is don't get caught up in arrows being something. We'll see that pretty soon there's all these uses of arrows they were very used to as computer scientists or math classes, where an arrow is a function of a set to a set. Um, I mean, computer science, you know, a function that's like 
square. We pass it a, an integer, right? Three, and it returns the square. It's, it's a function from one set, the set of integers, to another set, also the set of integers. It's the square function. And, and, and it turns out there's a self function there. It's the identity function, right? It takes in and returns it. But we can't get caught up in that being the only type of error. We computer scientists, our minds will often go there. Like, oh, it's a function. And a function is a good example of an error, but she, you know, she's being careful about not privileging that here. We have all these different types of errors. I mean, you know, they mean relation, familial relationships, they mean rotations, they mean, you know, this thing divides that, they mean that. You know, this thing is a subset of that. This thing sort of generalizes this. This has status, you know, higher status than um than than others in that category in that in that group or what have you. But um but the point is like arrows come in many, like they mean many different things, but they're all gonna have these sort of shared key properties. There's always this self one from a thing to itself. There's always this, if you have two arrows, you can always compose them. It's always going to be a composition. Um, and sometimes that thing you compose has got to be equal to something else you already know about. And sometimes it's it maybe something that's often new. Um, all these things will share this. This sort of So don't get caught up in it only being functions. Functions are really useful. Things we'll see it for, but here we, we see it being used for many pieces, many different types of context. So I'm interested in your, your sort of um, thoughts on, on this. Um, um, and, and if you want to talk a bit about this a little bit more before we talk about sort of context a bit, but does what I have been saying make sense you know, about how we use these arrows? to mean different things in different contexts. We'll, we'll say, okay, we're dealing with things, whether one thing divides one, and that'll be one context, and an arrow mean one thing, and then we'll, we'll go over here and we'll deal with family relationships, and an arrow means something something quite different, or we'll go up here and we're dealing with subset relationships, and an arrow means something different, but they share these features of kind of this self-arrow for every one of these objects, and then there's ability to compose. Does that, does that make sense to you? Yeah, uh, I had a question. Mm. Uh, so uh, yeah, generally, thinking about a uh, different way, uh, category, uh, different concepts, mm. and think um, thinking about different uh, relationship, different type of relationships mm. leads to different uh, results. Oh, yeah. It's true. Yeah, yeah, we'll um, find. Well, have different uh, and, findings for them. That's right. So for yeah. the category of stock for, flow, we'll we'll have different we'll have different things that we deduce from the category of stock flow, like how to compose yeah. stock flow diagrams that are quite different from how we compose petri nets or how we compose um, you know arrows in a familial relationship. Yeah, we'll have different. Right. We'll be able to right. encode the structure, the structure. Yeah our domain, the kind of rules of our domain, the rules of engagement, like like that will in, be encoded. It's like the, the arrows are like the actions, they're like the verbs. And it's almost like we're giving a grammar for what, when you compose it with what, it gives what. It's, it's like we're giving rules of the grammar of our domain. I don't know if that yeah. helps. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, for example, uh, convincing of uh, people of one plus one equal two, uh, and uh, but in the mathematics, for example, if you have a two set uh, that has a one element uh, of one and mm -hmm. one, when you want to union, uh, it become one. Right. So right. one like plus like one yeah. equal one. But right. uh, when uh, people can be one plus one equal two, that is right. not true. Yeah. So, so in that different context, results. In, 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 a, in, in the I context. This is something that's kind of getting into chapter four now about context that, you know, she says, 
you know, a key thing is to recognize, like, in a given context, what context are you in is key, to be clear. And in that context, there's absolute rules. Like, this is the case in that context. But then you, you have this ability with these same tools to, you know, go over and switch contexts. You know, we, we, we're we dealing with that and there are these strict rules for things, right? That one plus three is zero. And then we'll go over to this other context, you know, where one plus three is different, something different, right? Um, and 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 it's, we have to be very clear when we switch context in what context we're in and there'll be absolute rules in that context. But they're they're not, you know, like, the rules of the universe of what plus means that it can only mean this. It's like in that context, it absolutely means this. It's, it's completely un, unambiguous means this. But we sometimes will switch context to these other ones where plus means something different. Maybe it's plus means string concatenation, you know, and we stick these strings together. Or maybe, you know, it means that our arrays are appended or our trees are stuck together with a common root or something like that yeah i don't know if my that's question all. is yeah and my question is is it true for relationship uh for example if uh, we think about a uh, different type of re re relationship is it true that we say uh, we can uh, take a re different results of them like different concepts well um, Can we take a different relationship uh, results at a different uh, thinking about different relationship? Is it true like different concepts like chapter one? Well, I mean, chapter I uh, previous chapter. I think. Can we say this? Well, let me let me let me put it this way. Um, if you have relation, are you talking like family relationships? Or are you talking relationship? No, every with... every relationship is with uh, between teams. I mean. Uh, each context I, I, I... will have different rules for this. And, you know, when it comes to family relationships, there'll be different rules. I'll tell you, we don't have any Chinese speakers in here, but I'll tell you the rules for composing family relationships in Chinese are very different because they have, and maybe it's true in Farsi for all I know, you know, whatever, because they, they have, they have different rule like different ways of saying things they have far more words for relations um and they also have like a special word like you don't just say a is the aunt of b you have to say a is the is the older aunt of b where where it's related to who's b's mother or father was that you know through which it's the aunt right like so so like my mother's sister in order to use, in order to pick the word, I have to say, is it her older sister or her younger sister? You know, um, I don't know what they do for twins. You know, I'm not sure. Um, but um, uh, but that has kind of different words. And also like grandmother, like the rules, like there's not one, you don't just say grandmother, you say like my uh, la lao or my uh, nai nai um, or, or, or in different areas of China, they won't say la la, but they say wai po. Um, and, and like wai po means mother's mother. Um, whereas, you know, uh, nanai means father's mother. And it's like, there's so there's different rules about how these things combine, you know, like what co composed with what means what. And in each, each context will have these rules associated with it that are completely clear but there'll be different context to context, right? And like, like I'm sure Farsi will have different rules and Chinese will have different rules than English, et cetera. I don't know if that's helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Other, other comments on this though? I thought the um, analogy you used with grammars was really interesting, and it made me wonder if the context, because your rules are uh, going to impact your domain and translate things, uh, if context is more specific to rules than the domain itself, like obviously whatever your domain mm. is is going to be how the right. rules change it, but right. the context is the rules transformation where like, but yeah. Not. Yeah. So, so, so you're right. I mean, like, 
I mean, domain is kind of a loosey word and, and like we might be dealing with family matters, right? Um, but like we 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 might have, you know, like the same family could have their rules to kind of the rules of him, the grammar of families could be described in English. And and there's a set of rules that apply for how those words are used. Same family could be described in Chinese. My my family can be described in English and Chinese, and and so like it'll be different rules for it. And um, and, and so it's yeah. I mean, you could you could say you know loosely the term domain is kind of loose, right? It's kind of a, a looser concept, but but like um, there there can be. Uh, more specific you know particulars of context like we're describing the family in english terms or in chinese terms now it turns out that larissa this notion of grammar will will actually be a really deep one and we're going to see that okay so it, it turns out that and i don't want to jump ahead of ourselves but it, what we've seen here is actually the key key sort of rules of, of, of categories, okay? I, I bet, I've been talking about them. There's some other ones too, like associativity and unitality, but, but basically um, uh, what, I've, what I've told you about is, um, is getting at the, the heart of what makes a category a category. It's not everything, but it's, it's most of it. And you see, you know, can be applied in all these areas. But what I was gonna say is that, you know, when we're uh, dealing with, with this context where we have, uh, you know, in categories, it turns out a category is going to describe the grammar of things like stock flow diagrams. And, and it's not, it's nothing specific to stock flow diagrams. In general, we'll have like these schema categories that describe the grammar of a given domain. And it really is like the grammar. What can be stuck to what in a stock flow diagram? That's the schema category. It specifies the rules. Eric, have seen a bit of this with, with, um, uh, you know, model collab. If we're dealing with Petri nets, there's a grammar of Petri nets specified by the schema for Petri net. It kind of says what can be stuck to what, and and you know under what conditions, and 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 if you stick this together, what the result is, and and so on. It it's like this this rules of of how these things, the rules of engagement of these things. You know, so like in a stock flow diagram. There's certain things you can't do, right? You you can't have a flow determine the value, like like immediately impact the value of a stock by having like a, an arrow from the flow into the stock. Um, saying like your value is instantaneously determined by this by this flow, right? You can't have in in normal system dynamics, you can't have a flow just sitting spinning without any stocks attached to it. You can have a flow which has like it's from a stock or it's, and, and otherwise, you know, it's, it's from a stock and goes to a cloud or you can have a cloud go to a stock, um, you know, the flow there go into the stock, but from a cloud, or you could have it go between two stocks, but you can't have it go cloud to cloud. All these rules of kind of grammar of the grammar of stock flow diagrams, that's all specified in a category. And it's really cool. You can just read off you know, these kind of rules from the category. And um, and, and so it is a grammar. I, I, I don't mean that actually lightly. It's a, it's a very deep and, and um, fundamental analogy. And we'll see it ends up being super useful to think about it that way. We are, spe we are encoding the grammar with this category. And it turns out, I'll give you, I'll give away a large part of what's coming. It turns out that with the same grammar, that describes the form of what the form of a stock and flow diagram, or the the form of a Petri net, or or what have you, describes the kind of the form, right? Like a grammar describes the form of a English sentences or Chinese sentences or Farsi sentences or whatever, right? That's what a grammar does. It describes the form. Doesn't describe the semantics. Doesn't describe the meaning. Instead. There's going to be a thing called a functor that can map it to all sorts of different meanings. So the same stock flow diagram will be able to interpret in many ways. Some ways we'll see, ah, there are the causal loops in it. Some ways we'll see like, oh, we're going to run it. 
in the stock flow diagram will simulate it over time. Some will say like, what are the main loops that are driving it over time? And, and all these different things. Those will be the interpretations of this form. So, so as it as it turns out, we'll describe the like the grammar describes the form of it, like the shape of it, you know, what's allowed shape-wise, what can be stuck to what. But it doesn't describe the meaning. The meaning is through a map and two semantic domains, you know, different sorts. And that's that's very cool because. You can have the same stock flow diagram do all sorts of things with it. You can have the same Petrina do all sorts of things with it. Um, it's an incredibly powerful sort of idea, separating its form, its shape, its kind of, you know, how is it stuck together and so on, and then what it means. And we can avoid privileging one sort of meaning and interpret it through different lenses. That's cool. So, so. You put your finger, Larissa, on a key notion that will follow us through this course and through category theory. I don't know anyone else wants to say something here. I want to say something. And uh, she uh, she stresses uh, these uh, these um, topics that uh, you mentioned. Mm. Uh, we should um, uh, notice to uh, to logical structures mm. uh, of everything. Um, you want uh, you can be angry or disagree with these things, but yeah. you yeah. should notice to logical structures, and okay. um, uh, and uh, the right. abstract mathematics uh, help uh, to uh, to you, uh, um, and you can. Um, find these logical um, structures, but abstract mathematics yeah, by so helping out ma abstract mathematics. Yeah, it's very interesting, isn't it? Um, her her comments here and, and sort of abstract mathematics, um, you know, helps us, um, helps us sort of uh, reason about a more general set of things um it it joins together many structures that are otherwise you know we might consider just totally different things it helps us recognize the the hidden similarities there that oh these are just different faces of the you know different sides of the same coin they're, they're just different manifestations of the same basic underlying truths right um uh and and that you know, gives us this ability to take discoveries and ideas and insights and algorithms from one area to the next. We could transport them because we recognize, oh, they're just different faces of the same thing. I know how to do this. It's kind of like you learn to ride one bike, right? Um, and and you learn how to ride it, but then, you know, if, I mean, it would still be useful if you learn how to ride that particular bike, right? Like that specific piece of metal right your name and etched in it or whatever um but but it's much more powerful than that you learn how to bike right you learn how to bicycle and so you could take up you know a different bike or a different bike you could go to a different continent and bike around because you learn you know how to bike you and and the same idea comes over you could also probably you know, go on a motorcycle or a moped or a scooter or whatever, right? You know, the basic process of, hey, don't lean too far to the left or right. And, you know, um, make sure you break ahead of time. Um, and, you know, you got to keep your balance on it side to side and, and you know, um, be careful when it's raining because it'll be slippery. Right? Like all these things carry over and they carry over you know, a lot more than that particular bike you learned, which might be, you know, really small bike, you know, but now you can take it in all sorts of places. That's the cool thing. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, that that's, that's a neat side of it. Mm. Yeah. I love, I've loved what you were uh, saying, uh, Nona, about, uh, about some of these, uh, some of these insights and, you know, in a way, as you said, it's not that you, have to agree with all, you know, diagram. And just like with a simulation model, you, you know, it, it you, you may not 
agree with its assumptions, but by putting it out there, you know, by by taking out of someone's head and putting in in the clear light of day, you can look at it. And you can say, do I agree with it? Where do I agree with it? Where do I disagree? You know, um, where am I unsure? What can we do to improve it? Right? It, by taking it out, and it's the same thing here. You can take out of our head, and we we could say, well, you know, this is. This is a good start, but it's 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 limited. We really want to capture this other relationship. We want to capture stepsister, not just sister. We want to capture stepmother. We want to capture a you know foster family or whatever, and we can then work to improve it. But it's taking it out of our head and putting it in a form that's unambiguous, and so we could say where we can agree and disagree. You know, uh, Francis Bacon, right? He said, "Truth." sooner comes from error than from confusion. We put something out there, people critique it, and we advance it. Um, it's not quite uh, applicable here, but you know, it's through, it's through getting it just fully described that we learn where our confusions are, what doesn't work to describe our situation, and we can then advance it. And category theory is the most general language by far of any I know that describes just a vast array of things. Um, other people too, well, other voices. I'll tell you one thing I, I kind of really appreciated you know, category theory, again, it's, it's often, you know, applied and very commonly in, in certain areas. I really liked how in this chapter, she, she applied it to all sorts of things. She said, you know, there's other contexts where one plus one isn't two. Isn't two. And she didn't just confine herself to mod, you know, mod two or whatever, right? Or one plus one is zero, right? Um, she talked about clocks. She talked about rotations. She talked about mixing colors of paints right um and if you think about uh, you know piles of sand and if you think about it there's other examples too sounds for example when you when you have two sounds you know one sound and two sounds you combine them you get another sound but it's not like two it's it's like okay this is a sound or you know sodium and chloride as like you know um as as a molecular species, you get salt. NaCl and you you get salt, right? And 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 so this is a very very general concept, and I really liked how I love the paint example. I think that's great. Right, colors of paint, right? You mix colors of paint, mm -hmm. you don't get you don't get like two paints. You get like you know as long as it's the same. I guess you if you mix watercolor with oil paints, maybe you don't get. <laughs> you know, to you know, get one color or something like that. You get you know, some weird immiscible, you know, uh, superposition or something. But yeah, I thought it was pretty cool. Um, any anyone else sort of um, uh, have have sort of comments here on this? What did you think about the metric stuff? Um, these these metrics, not metric system, right? But metric like distance. Um, remember this thing she was talking about distance and the points equidistant from a point within uh, she... Euclidean space. She, you know, it's a circle. But do you remember what it looked like in? The taxi cab metric, or also called the Manhattan metric, I think it's I think there's another. For, what is it? What what what, what does it look like there? Uh huh. Uh, for example, uh, she um, she explained at the two uh, graphs uh, uh, to. Um, for example, uh, in the taxi in taxi cab, uh, when you are uh, here and you want to go here, uh, yeah. you should uh, x plus uh, y. Right. But um, uh, but in the uh, 
in the uh, Euclidean, Euclidean uh, you, yeah. Euclidians, you should x um, power 2 uh, plus y yeah. power 2 and um, power 1 uh, divided half that uh, you you use Euclidean but and this is L, L2 and mm -hmm. for Ln yeah. you yeah. should um, you should use x uh, n plus uh, right. y n um, uh, 1 divided n there uh, she said uh, there are different um, different scale uh, for um for difference um uh, for the for the distance yep. and uh, this is um this is uh, up to you that which points you are using and uh, which metrics you are using and uh, uh, this is separated uh, separate events that's right now um as she says you know mathematics exhibits this kind of um this tension between, or this balance, she puts it, I like that, between great fluidity, um, where you can move between worlds and rigidity, you know, within a, a given area. And what she said is, you know, that sometimes um, uh, you you define, you know, you, you have rules in place. And I really loved how she expressed this. You have you have rules in place that that define sort of what that things are consistent. They're basically reasonable. They're they're um, you know in in a given area. And when it comes to metrics, there are certain things like we we don't just allow anything you know whatsoever to be um, to be a metric. Like it has to satisfy some conditions. Like you can't be negative. Like and and a lot of these have to do with common sense sort of things we look for for it to be a reasonable choice, right? If if you were to say like things are, you know, some distance from themselves or something, right? If if it was a kind of relationship of a point to itself, you know, can be greater than distance greater than zero, that'd be kind of weird. It wouldn't really be self consistent, or, um, you know, it. It, it wouldn't be kind of reasonable or this this triangle inequality that if you add a waypoint, you go from if you want to go from A to B, whatever L1, L2, whatever the, the rules are, the metric is, you know, that should be no more than going from A to B to, you know, sorry, going from A to C directly should be should be no more of a in metric space and distance then go from A to B and then B to C, right? You, it's sort of like adding a waypoint, adding something else that you have to go to along the way shouldn't shorten the distance, right? Um, and and again, you can you might find contexts where these are th these will be specific, you know, challenged, but but for a huge variety of things, these things hold. And there's other things too, like A to B and same as B to A. Not all of these like hold in all context, right? Like you might imagine a, a distance that's like based on energy, right? And so for me to go out there, you can't see it, but you know, up that hill, I'll consider bigger distance than going from the top of the hill down to me because it takes more work or something. That would be a different thing, right? It wouldn't be a metric there. It would be something else, um, or at least not in the same, you know, the Euclidean distance wouldn't be a metric or it wouldn't be you know, wouldn't satisfy that property. So the point is that like in different contexts, we'll have different rules of engagement, but these rules, non-negativity, zero self-distance, triangle inequality, symmetry, real value, like these hold for a vast variety of metrics, you know, just, just man, you know, fantastic variety of distance. And knowing that we can switch, you know, we know our basic rules of engagement, or rules of what's reasonable, hold across all these and we can make tons of immediate conclusions about this new area because it obeys this basic rule of reasonability. We can make immediate, we can apply understanding from one area to another because all that all that it assumes is these things. Boom. You know, these these six basic or these these basic principles of, of metrics. So you know we'll see that more in chapter six. Um, uh, in a lot more detail. Okay. Okay. I know it's 620 now. I'd love to go on, but I've got to get over to the hospital. And so I 
apologize. Um, but um, we're going to, so, so I wish I could be with you Thursday, but again, I'm on my way to the airport. Can't go earlier. Can't go later. Um, so we're going to make up these times, times from Thursday, times there. Um, but our next meeting together in person, I'm looking forward to it, will be Tuesday, this you know week from today. And for that, we're going to read the next two chapters, right? Um, so continuing on, we had relationships. So we did last time, one, two, three. This time we did four, five, right? Um, and next time we'll do six and, and, and seven. Oh, that's interesting. Um, yeah, Larissa. Wow, that's really neat. Yeah, uncles are different depending on uncles, paternal or maternal. Yeah, same thing in Chinese. Um, uh, and paternal aunt also means mother-in-law. That's really interesting. Um, that's super interesting. I've got to learn Cree sometime. Um, so chapter six and chapter seven, um, I think we'll we'll do. Those are the last two chapters before we get into the nitty-gritty of, of categories. And does anyone prefer um for reasons to you know that you'd really really like to go through six and seven one at a time or especially because it's a week from today are you okay doing both together are we are we comfortable with the speed remember i said we're going to do this course slower if required but are we comfortable reading those two chapters for a week from today given that you have this extra time are we okay with that yeah that's fine with me anyone else Thanks for bearing with this. I'm finding this a lot of fun. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, folks. And uh, I will see you in person a week from today um, there uh, in um, Thorvaldson 125. Thanks very much. And all the best to you. And uh, look forward to, to returning back Monday is what I'm expecting and looking good for that. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Take care there. Thanks. I'll be posting the video to the course site.